Okay, I'm pleased to introduce today's uh, EE Colloquium speaker, uh, Kai Mei Fu. Kai Mei did her uh, bachelor's at Princeton and then her in, in physics and then her MS and uh, PhD in applied physics at Stanford, finishing up at Stanford in uh, 2007. After, uh, after Stanford, she went and worked at HP Labs uh, from, for four years, from 2007 to two, uh, 2011. And then we were very happy when she uh, agreed to join us uh, starting in, uh, just in September 2011 as uh, joint faculty in physics and electrical engineering. Uh, Kaime's work is in the area of uh, optical control of spins in uh, solid, state, uh, solid state systems with uh, lots of applications in uh, quantum information processing and, and other areas. Thank you, Scott. So it's my pleasure today to share with you my research um, towards large-scale quantum computing using spins and photons on a chip. Much of the work I'll be presenting today um, took place during my time as a postdoc at HP Labs. And the specific, but I'm continuing this work on quantum information processing in Diamond here at the University of Washington. The talk is organized in the following way. First, I'm going to give some motivation for why I even do quantum information processing in Diamond. Next, I'll discuss some experimental demonstrations of the coupling of the admission from a nitrogen vacancy center to an optical cavity, which is a device that we want for doing the quantum information processing. And then I will move on to discuss the next steps we need towards actually building an integrated quantum network in Diamond. Here in this picture, you see a futuristic device of what a quantum computer might look like in five or 10 years. In this particular device, we have single impurities that are coupled to small micro ring cavities, if you'll see the cursor. Um, and these single impurities store the quantum information in their spin. They emit light that's then coupled into ring resonators, that couples into waveguides, that can then couple into 3 dB beam splitters, detected off chip in this case through gratings, to do something that we call photon interference. And if in this way we're able to entangle, and I'll discuss this a little bit more in detail, different spins from different devices into a graph state. All right, why do we want to build a quantum information processor? In classical information, we store all our information in a bit. The bit can take on two values, 0 or 1. And we control this bit. Um, using what we know about Maxwell's equations that will control the evolution of our bit in our circuits and in our computers. Quantum information, we store information in a qubit. The qubit can take on an infinite number of values. It's an arbitrary superposition state of 0 and 1. And we write the wave vector in the following form. It's alpha a plus beta 1 with the condition that alpha squared plus beta squared equals 1. Alpha squared is the probability that our quantum bit is in state 0, and beta squared is the probability that our quantum bit is in state 1. And the evolution of our bit is now governed by Schrodinger's equation, no longer Maxwell's equations. It turns out there's been proven that there are certain quantum algorithms that can solve problems that can't be solved on a classical computer. The most famous one of which is Shor's algorithm, which shows that you can factor products of large prime numbers in polynomial time if, in fact, you head a quantum computer. It's also very useful to be able to simulate large quantum systems. All the materials that we have that exist are actually large quantum systems. And if we want to actually engineer materials, it's important to be able to simulate what might occur in a controlled fashion, since we can't actually calculate the full quantum mechanical calculation. And finally, the most advanced quantum information application is in secure communication. If you use quantum bits instead of classical bits, it is physically impossible by the laws of physics for an eavesdropper to copy and detect your quantum, your, your quantum bit or your qubit without being detected. So there is a lot of motivation 
to create a quantum key distribution. And for this, for long distance quantum key distribution, we need somewhat extensive quantum information processors. So back in 2000, when the field was, was quite a bit younger, we tried to build quantum computers the same way we build classical, or a quantum circuit the same way we build a classical circuit. Here we can imagine we have our bits of interest. Here we have some extra bits that we use for our computation. We can do operations on a bit, perhaps flip it to a one. In our case, we can actually rotate it through any angle because it can take on a superposition state. We can also have interactions or controlled operations, which we denote with this little dot that this operation is going to be controlled depending on the state here. And we follow this in a linear fashion and when we do a measurement. One thing that's very difficult to do is to create these gates, these control gates between two qubits. As I said before, quantum bits evolve according to Schrodinger's equation, and it's very difficult to get Schrodinger's equation and all the variables in our environment separated from what's happening to our quantum bit. So actually making these circuits is difficult for an experimentalist, even though the theorists have shown all sorts of neat tricks we can do if we actually could build this type of circuit. Around the, the year 2000, a couple of papers came out that indicated that there was another way that we could build a quantum computer. And what a particular important paper that came out, which was called a one-way quantum computer, what they showed was that we didn't need to have these classical circuit diagrams anymore. What we could instead is build up entanglement between different nodes. And let me just briefly review what entanglement is. If we have two quantum bits, we can represent the state of the two quantum bits with this superposition state here. And what it means is that we, if we measure one bit in zero, we will automatically measure the other bit in one. If we measure the first bit in one, we'll automatically measure the second bit in zero. But the probability of measuring either state is still 50%. So this is a special entangled state that can't exist uh, classically. What Rosendorf and Riegel showed was that we can, if we can create entanglement and each line between each dot is, means that these quantum bits are entangled, then we can perform an arbitrary quantum computation by just doing single quantum bit measurements of the states at each node. So the problem becomes we no longer have to make all these gates, but we have to make this huge network of entangled quantum bits on the right. One positive thing about this is that there's a way to create this quantum network or this big entangled graph state indeterministically. We can have some probability of failure, but that's okay. We can keep trying until we actually create the graph. Whereas in our former circuit diagram, if one of these operations failed, we'd have to start the calculation over again. So in this case, we can have failure when we're creating the entangled state. Once we've confirmed that we've created this entangled state, we can do our calculation by just measuring is each bit in zero or one at the end. And we can do an arbitrary quantum computation. So this is all very nice because it's actually somewhat easy to measure single quantum states. But now the hard part is how do we create entanglement between tens or hundreds or thousands of quantum bits? How do we create? that graph state. OK, so now we're going to do um, a little thought experiment where we have two atoms. We have two atoms, and each atom can exist in a ground or excited state. And we stick our two atoms in the excited state. Then we take a detector between the two atoms. At some time t, the detector clicks. At that time, we don't know if the atom, if that photon that we detected came from atom A or atom B, because those two atoms emit photons that are indistinguishable, that are the same. So we're actually left with an entangled state 
of zero and one, where one is the excited state, plus one is zero. Because either state A emitted the photon and went to the ground state, or state B emitted the photon and went to the ground state. This is not very useful because if we, with atoms and you've excited them, they tend to radiatively decay in 10 nanoseconds. So once the other atom decays, then you no longer have this state. So you created this entanglement for 10 nanoseconds. It'll be very difficult to do hundreds of these operations and create a graph if each entanglement only lasts for 10 nanoseconds. Okay, the, this entanglement is based on two facts. One is the impossibility to determine from the detection event which atom the photon came from. And the second is the projection postulation of quantum mechanics. After the detection of the state of the atoms, um, after the detection, the state of the atoms is projected onto one which is compatible with the outcome of the measurement. Since both states are compatible with the outcome of the measurement, you're left with both states in the entangled state. All right, so we don't want this to last just for 10 nanoseconds. We want it to last longer, and for that, we need another resource to store quantum information. Not whether our atom is in an excited optical state or an excited ground state, but now we're actually gonna say whether our atom, in this case, these lower two states are going to correspond to spin states. For example, spin up or spin down of an electron, and we have an excited optical state, E, that we can access with a laser transition. So in this case, we have a weak excitation pulse, so weak that on average we only get less than one photon. So if we do get one photon, um, we know there was only one photon and not two photons. So we have this weak excitation pulse, or we could say we have a single photon that comes into a beam splitter. And then it's going to be split between two paths, one going to atom one, and one going to atom two. These two atoms are prepared to be initially in the ground state. So now we either have atom one excited and then admits by Raman emission into state one, or we have atom two excited and then it stimulates or it emits a photon into state one. We then recombine this admission onto a beam splitter and detect the photon. Because we recombine the admission onto this beam splitter, we have no way of knowing whether this atom decayed or this atom decayed. And in the end, our final state becomes a superposition state of zero and one, where now these zero and one states are spin states that have a long lifetime. Okay, so now we have a way to create entanglement through photon interference to create a qubit state, two qubits that are entangled. We have our two qubits that are entangled. We're now gonna entangle them with more qubits to create our graph state. With our graph state, we're gonna do single photon or single qubit measurements, and we're gonna make a quantum computer. So that's the main idea behind the motivation of my research. This type of free space system um, has a very small probability of success. And groups are working on demonstrating this with single emitters, with single ions, and they will get there. They will demonstrate this entanglement probably in the next year or so um, with hours and hours of integration for, for two entangled bits. It will be a feat. It will be very exciting. But long term, we want to do better. And the way we're going to do that is by integrating everything onto a chip. In this particular case, Information, as I said before, is stored in spins. Entanglement is generated through photons. So we need on-chip efficient collection, routing, and detection of photons. And we'd like to get this to 100% detection efficiency. So we have our, in this case, a color center in diamond. It's emitting a photon that's coupled to a spin. It goes in to a micro ring switch, and as I said before in the other diagram where all the cavities are micro rings, it can now interact and become, in, it can interfere with other photons from other spins and create entanglement between spins located at every single one of these cavities. Okay. The material system, one material system that I'm working on in my lab to realize this system is a nitrogen vacancy center in diamond. In the diamond lattice, you remove two carbon atoms in the place of one, you put a nitrogen atom and you leave the other one vacant. This is one of hundreds of color centers 
that exist inside of diamond. So originally, uh, I studied it in natural diamond uh, when I first came to HP. Then element six started making man-made CVD-grown diamond that had good enough spin and spectral properties that we could start using commercial uh, diamond. And we use the kind of clear diamond that you see on your left-hand side because, uh, as you may or may not know, the impurities inside diamond is what gives diamond color. In this particular case, we have a lot of nitrogen, and that's what gives this diamond um, the yellow color. Interestingly enough, for applications, in particular, if you wanted to use these color centers for probes, for biological tagging, these are stable centers in particles as small as five nanometers. They've been shown to exist. For quantum information processing, these, stable, these NV centers indeed do exist. They do emit light, but the light is not very coherent. It's not very useful for quantum information processing is useful for biological applications. All right, so what do I mean by long coherence time? Um, the nitrogen vacancy center is a, has, three, has two spins in the ground state. The alignment of the spins correspond to there being three spin states, ms equals zero and ms equals plus or minus one. The, if you create a superposition state of two of these states, the coherence can last into the millisecond time scale. This might seem very short to, compared to someone that is used to uh, how long they can store information on a USB stick or a, or a hard drive, um, but it is very long for quantum information processing, especially at room temperature. In particular, if you took, if you took a, an electron spin at room temperature, the time scale would be picoseconds, is how long you would actually be able to store a spin coherence time. The excited states, it's, these ground spin states are optically coupled to excited states, and this enables optical spin readout, so we can detect whether our qubits in state zero or state one, for example. And also, we can create electron entanglement through that photon interference protocol that I showed you before. In order for that photon interference protocol to work, there are some stringent requirements. And one is that the admission between two different NV centers needs to be um, spectrally, spectrically identical. So this is actually quite a strong statement and very difficult to realize in solid state systems. So let's look at the spectral properties of the nitrogen vacancy center in diamond. If we excite the nitrogen vacancy center in diamond up to the optical states, we typically excite up into the phonon sidebands, and the system decays to the ground state, and it emits a photon at a frequency um, that's the ZPL frequency, which corresponds to the zero phonon line. And that's this sharp peak that you see here. And those are the photons that we want to have interfere onto our beam splitter. Unfortunately, there's also a high probability in our crystal that instead of just getting a zero phonon line, um, we're going to get, this should not say ZPL, we're going to get a shifted photon plus a phonon out because energy can be carried away by the phonons in our crystal. And in this case, what you're getting are these broad phonon sidebands in the admission. 97% of the admission in our color center is into these unwanted phonon sidebands. So what we want is to have efficient collection of this ZPL line in our devices, and we also want to enhance this collection or this transition and suppress these unwanted phonon sideband transitions. Additionally, we have our emitter that's emitting in four pi directions. It is very hard to efficiently collect the photons from an emitter that's emitting in all different directions, so we want to engineer our system so it only emits into one useful mode. We can do that by putting our emitter in an optical cavity. If we put our emitter in an optical cavity and emits a photon, if the cavity has certain parameters, it is more likely to admit that photon into the cavity mode. Then it will bounce around and interact with that atom repeatedly and cause stimulated emission and cause more emission into the useful cavity mode. So what happens when you put your 
your emitter into this cavity is that you get something called the Brassell enhancement, which means that you get a lifetime reduction due to admission into the cavity. And this lifetime reduction or this increase in the rate is given by the following formula where you see that it's proportional to the quality factor of the cavity. That's how long you can store the photon in the cavity. Inversely proportional to the mode volume of the cavity. That's how, how small the cavity is, which gives you how strong the electromagnetic um, fields are. You also want to have it located at the maximum of the cavity. You also want the dipole moment of your emitter to be aligned to the polarization of your electric field inside the cavity. And so this formula is for when the resonance of the atom is on resonance with the cavity. So you need that the cavity frequency, resonance frequency, to be the same as the NV. You need the NV at cavity maximum. You need the NV polarization to be aligned to the cavity mode. And you need a high quality factor in your cavity and a small mode volume. OK, so we want to make these cavities because we want to efficiently collect zero phonon line admission. How are we going to do this? So this is kind of a timeline of all the different cavities that I studied during my time at HP. When we first began, when I first began at HP, what we were trying to do was couple nitrogen vacancy centers and tiny nanoparticles to silica microdisks. So this cavity looks very, very different from what we've shown with the simple Fabry-Perot cavity, where light is just bouncing back and forth between two mirrors here. In this case, what we have is a disk cavity where light is now rotating around or traveling around the circumference of the disk, and you get constructive or destructive interference when you've made a complete circle of the light wave. So we have a tiny nanoparticle, and we stuck it at the edge of our microcavity. We can couple into and out of the cavity through a tapered fiber. What we do in this case is an optical fiber that we stuck in a torch, and we pulled. We pulled this fiber until it was only a few hundred nanometers thick, which means it has some field outside the fiber. And then that field can interact with the cavity, and you can actually get perfect coupling where all the light that comes in through the fiber gets transmitted into the cavity mode. This was nice because it had relatively easy cavity fabrication. I could use uh, silicon or thermal oxide cavities. I could make cavities that had Qs exceeding a million. Um, what was, and I, I found a way to put the nitrogen vacancy centers right at the edge of the cavity. It turns out if you dip these ring disks into a solution with nanoparticles, the drying of the, of the, in this case it was IPA, the last place the IPA exists is right at the edge. So you get your nanoparticles right at the edge, at the maximum field, which was a nice advantage. The thing that we couldn't overcome with this system was that the spectral properties of nitrogen vacancy centers and nanoparticles were poor and we didn't have a way to engineer them. So we moved on to bulk diamond, using single crystal diamond to create nanoparticles. In one case, what we did was we created a ring resonator out of a different type of material. And this type of material is gallium phosphide. So we're actually going to have our emitter inside the diamond. It's going to interact with a field that is trapped inside a microcavity that's sitting on the surface of the diamond. This had the advantage of better NV characteristics because we're working a single crystal diamond. Um, we had the option in the future of integration with uh, in, uh, using the electro-optic properties of the gallium phosphide, which is something that I am, I am continuing here at University of Washington. Um, it does have some fabrication challenges. It's difficult to fabricate. And you have a lower field. You're working with the evanescent field into the diamond, um, which makes the coupling less strong. Then finally, my very last year at HP, uh, very thin, five micron thin films of diamond became commercially available. In this, you can stick your 5 micron thin, thin film of diamond, stick it on a low index substrate, thin it all the way down to 200 nanometers, create a ring resonator, and then have your electromagnetic field that propagates around this ring, interact with a nitrogen vacancy center that just happens to be in the ring. And you can study those properties. This has the advantage that you have, again, better NV characteristics because you're at 
the high, uh, you're in single crystal diamond, and you have a high electromagnetic field at the NV site. Um, and then a huge challenge with this is, is working with five micron diamond, five micron thick diamond substrates and trying to fabricate with them. So here's an example of a final device that we tested, which is a gallium phosphide ring cavity on top of diamond. Um, this is a scanning electron micro picture, and along with it, you can see the finite difference time domain simulations, which show the electromagnetic field inside the cavity. This is the TE field that's transverse electric, and our nitrogen vacancy center we created by implanting nitrogen into our sample with 10 kilo, uh, kilo electron volt energy to end up being about 15 nanometers from the surface of the diamond. This is an SEM uh, picture of the diamond on silicon on SiO2 cavity, um, and as well as the finite difference time domain simulations. Um, in this particular case, it was much more difficult to figure out what mode. It's a many mode. It's a larger device. Um, device, and this just shows the, the first four radial modes inside this device. Again, it's sitting on a low index material. It's sitting on, in this case, uh, thermal oxide. All right, so how do we tell whether our NV center is interacting with our cavity or not? Um, we know that we've created a cavity. We know that there's an NV center in there because we scan from the top and we can see spectrally that there is an NV center in there. Now, what we need to do is actually tune the cavity resonance onto the NV resonance and see if we see any effect. So in this experiment, what we do is we excite a single NV with green light. Then we collect all the phonon sidebands with, um, actually in this case, we're not collecting the phonon sidebands. We're collecting the zero phonon line with the, red, with the red path here. And we actually just collect. So when the this, when this single NV center admits into the cavity, that's going to scatter around in the cavity. It's going to go around, and then it's going to scatter up a defect and scatter out. That's naturally what occurs in the experiment. So we're actually going to collect from the entire surface and, and collect all the light that just scatters off of defects in the cavity to see if we see anything. So here you can see a photoluminescence spectrum of our device. And the nitrogen vacancy center is actually several of them that are in this low resolution peak. And then you can also see the cavity modes. Here's a TE mode, here's a TM mode, and here's a T mode. What you see in this graph is that the TE mode of this cavity is blue detuned from our resonance. So we need to get this cavity mode to be on resonance of our NV center in order to see an effect. So the way we do that in this particular experiment is this is all done at, at around 10 Kelvin, is we let in a little bit of xenon gas into our cryostat. When we let in a little bit of xenon gas into our cryostat, it freezes onto our device, making our device a little bigger. If our device is a little bigger, then our modes will shift. So that's what we do in this following graph here, where you see something that's called tuning cycle. In each one of these steps, someone's just turned a knob and closed it. Turned a knob and closed it, let in a little bit of xenon gas. And you can see as you do this, you begin to redshift the cavity modes. So if you zoom in on this, it's actually a doublet, which is labeled lambda plus and lambda minus, and these cavity modes are going to shift. So here's a function of wavelength. We now want to look in the NV center, which is around 637. And here you see a series of peaks that correspond to different NV centers. And what you see is that the cavity modes, as they overlap with the NV centers, certain ones get really bright. And for one like right here, it gets extremely bright. And this is a good candidate for seeing whether or not you have strong cavity NV interaction. We do the same exact experiment with the all diamond cavity. In this case, again, you can see the cavity modes. And then you have a force of peaks that are the NV peaks. And we want to let xenon gas in to slowly tune these cavity modes into our nitrogen vacancy center transitions. Here you see the cavity modes tuning right here. Here you see the NV centers being straight. And then you can see in this particular example for NV1 what the luminescence looks like when you're not on resonance and then what the luminescence that we collect looks like when we tune the cavity 
onto resonance. Okay. We can quant we need to quantitatively be able to measure what this cavity and V interaction. And what I said before is that there's going to be a Purcell enhancement given by this equation, and that means that the lifetime of our emitter is now going to become 1 plus F times the original lifetime. So if we do lifetime measurements of our emitter as we tune the cavity onto resonance, we should see the lifetime decrease on resonance and the lifetime increase uh, when it's off of resonance. If this was a perfect emitter, i.e. all the admission was into the zero phonon line, we didn't have these phonon sidebands, if we have a Brassell factor of one, then we would get a lifetime reduction of 50%, or we would get a lifetime reduction of a factor of two. It would have half the lifetime. Unfortunately, all that we're enhancing with our cavity is this ZPL enhancement. We're not doing anything to this phonon sideband enhancement, so if we wanted to see a lifetime reduction of 50%, that would correspond to a Brassell factor of 33% or uh, for cell factor of 33. So we're actually looking, for, so, so very minute changes in the lifetime correspond to very actually large interactions between our center and our cavity. So in gallium phosphide, we look at it on and off resonance, and we actually see a reduction on the same NV from 11.6 nanoseconds down to 9.7 nanoseconds with a Purcell enhancement of uh, 6.3. That means about uh, 20 some to 30 percent of our light is actually making it into our cavity, whereas before the amount of light that we could just collect in free space was very much um, was a was a factor of six less than this. Actually, it doesn't it doesn't quite. And that corresponds to, because we have the phonon sidebands, we have about 20% of the light that we're able to collect now. So we want to get to 100%, but we're about 20%. In diamond, it's even better. When we do the same experiment, we measure the lifetime when it's on resonance and the lifetime when it's off resonance. We get 11.1 .1 nanoseconds to 8.3 nanoseconds for a Purcell factor of 11, and it's 30 some odd percent of the light that we can now collect or have admitted into our cavity. So what are our next steps now that we can show that we can get an appreciable amount of our light into an optical cavity for creating these integrated optical networks? Um, there's small fabrication things. One is just refine the fabrication. It was pretty rough. We can get higher cues theoretically by having smoother sidewalls. We can also make smaller devices. That's not technologically very difficult. Um, a recent HP Labs result that occurred after I left was they showed a photonic crystals. They can get a Purcell factor of 70 which corresponds to more than 90% of the light being emitted into the cavity. Um, the next is to have these cavities coupled to waveguides, so now we can efficiently route them onto a chip, and also make these, these orange are actually waveguide switches, so we can actually route, route the photon to where we want to on the chip. Um, these will be challenging tasks, but one thing that we can use is all the knowledge that's been gained in 3.5 semiconductors and silicon photonics, all of these types of devices without the quantum emitter are just classical photonic devices. And there's been a lot of progress in those fields in recent years. The probably larger challenge and progress is being made now is how to improve the spectral properties of these near surface NVs. So if we go back to what these NVs were in these, in these latter two cases, in the first case, we have an NV center that was created by bombarding our crystal with a nitrogen atom ion. And then having a nitrogen ion there it creates a bunch of vacancies. We stick our crystal in an oven that causes the vacancies to diffuse. It has a 20% chance of forming an NV center, and we get our NV center. But we also get a lot of other stuff in the crystal nearby. And this other stuff can interact with our NV center, causing decoherence and causing shorter lifetimes. In the diamond-only sample, we don't do this. We just use the residual nitrogen that's already in. But that means working with diamond that has a lot of nitrogen in it already to have enough NV centers. And it turns out nitrogen itself is a dephasing process, or is a dephasing, uh, can cause dephasing of our NV center. So we really want a deterministic way to create our NV centers without causing all the unwanted effects. When I showed you that two millisecond 
decoherence time on the very first graph of the spins, that was for an NV center that was grown during the growth process that was more than 10 microns from any surface in a very, very pure crystal. So what do I mean by poor spectral properties? Well, here you see four different spectra of NV centers in different samples. In the first one, you can see commercial nanodiamond. Although I don't prove it, I know that these peaks here, because you can do an autocorrelation measurement, correspond to single NV centers. And this is the zero phonon line. These are spectrally huge. What you actually have is the NV line diffusing back and forth over the space during the time of the measurement. And if it emits a photon here, and then emits a photon here, those won't be indistinguishable. This is not going to be useful. And this is why we don't use nanodiamond. Promisingly, here you have electron irradiated CVD sample. At least on this scale, it seems like we're looking at about 1,000 or so NV centers. They're all emitting at the same wavelength. So that's promising. Um, at this time, I wanted to do diamond nano work. So I said, well, why don't I start with that? And I make diamond nano, nano diamond. So I took my, my single crystal diamond, and I took a pestle and mortar, and I ground it up, and I made powder, and I stuck it in a centrifuge to get small particles out. And when I did that, I got this. What was promising was that the individual lines generally was still quite sharp. What was and in, a, in particles as small as a couple hundred nanometers, which was the smallest particle that I could find in NV center in this somewhat high purity material. What indicated there will be a problem is that because of the strain inside of nanocrystals, they were all emitting at different wavelengths. Now, there is a way to tune the wavelength using electric fields, but practically speaking, we cannot tune it over tens of terahertz. So that's one problem with the spectrum NV centers is that they can be inhomogeneous from NV centers. The NV center we can solve if we look at a very, very pure sample. Again, we're very far from a diamond surface in a very pure sample. Now we have to do, we can no longer just take a spectra. The resolution is too small. So we zoom in on this line and actually look at several NV centers. The way we do that is we scan a laser <laughs> over the transition and collect the phonon sidebands. So as we scan the laser over the transition, we get emission only when we're on resonance. And the line width of this emission is the line of, of our absorption transition. And you can see for different NVs that the transition energy shifts. But now we're talking about a 10 gigahertz change from NV to NV in bulk crystal and not 10 terahertz change. So there have been many groups, Stuttgart, Harvard, at Stuttgart, at Harvard, at Delft, at UCSB, and at HP Labs, that have shown that it's, it's not difficult to tune this amount so we can get all these NVs to line up using an electric field on this scale. OK, so that's inhomogeneous broadening. The next type of spectral problems is that let's just say we look at, we now, instead of just taking this one time average spectra, we actually zoom in on one of these peaks as a function of time. And when we do that, what we see is actually it's many even sharper peaks that are jumping around. And all we did was add it all up to get one somewhat broader peak. Now, a photon from here is not going to be indistinguishable from a photon at this transition. So we need a way to have all of these line up to not have the spectral diffusion. Another point is that we learned, and this was actually kind of surprising, um, is that it was strongly temperature dependent, much more temperature dependent than we expected. And it could be uh, explained. Uh, we collaborated with theorists to understand the temperature dependence. But it turned out that it was a dynamic Jan Teller effect that was occurring in our crystal. And for the, it has interesting solid state um, Physics is interesting solid state physics, but in terms of quantum information, what it meant for our system was we just had to make sure we worked at 10 Kelvin and below to avoid this broadening of our individual lines. So this here is the same NV center, just at two different temperatures. Okay, so we have this problem that we have this thing diffusing. Um, just this year, uh, our work at HP Labs showed that if you put electrodes on the sample, we already knew that we could stark shift, but you can actually do it in real time. 
And by using a feedback loop, you can control that diffusion. So you can get a single NV center to be emitting at approximately the same frequency um, over time. So that was a big step. Um, and it, it's coming out in physical review letters. All right, so this was all for NV centers that were deep inside the diamond crystal. What, have, what do NV centers look like where we've implanted them right at the surface? Because these are the useful ones for our photonic network, right? Either we've made it all out of diamond, but the diamond are photonic devices that are very, that are nanometer scale, or we have the gallium phosphide devices interacting with NV centers right near the surface of the diamond. In this case, we have a sample that's been implanted with 10 keV nitrogen. We're doing the same type of scan. If you look deep inside the bulk at just a natural occurring NV center, you see the straight line. It turns out at the end of each pump, you can see that the line blinks off. This is standard, what we see. Sometimes it blinks off. So what we do at the end of a scan is apply a green laser repump, and that might turn it back on. So that's what's occurring here. But you still get a straight line. With that repump on for an implanted NV, you actually can't even correlate what these different bright spots are coming from. Is it a single NV? Do we have two NVs? I don't know. If we turn the repump off, you can start to see individual tracks in implanted NVs. But once they're off, you turn the repump back on, you can't actually predict where it's going to show up again. So we can't really use that tuning on systems that have such poor spectral properties such as this. So if we can't implant them to get them to the near surface, and we know that ones that are grown deep inside the surface have good spectral properties, the next thing to do is try to find someone that grows diamond. You find someone that grows diamond, give them some nice diamond and say, grow me just the top 100 nanometers of nice diamond with some nitrogen inside of it. So we'll have some NV centers. So we worked with two growth collaborators, one at the University of Melbourne. And here you can see that we, with the constant repump, is that we are getting a straight line. If you compare it to the single NV center, it's broader. That's true, but it's significantly better. So we're on the right track in terms of, of what you can do with these dope layers. And we think that this is the way that we'll have to go. One nice thing is we also worked with another set of, another growth collaborators at AIST in Japan. And in their sample, so in this particular sample, what we can't understand is why each individual scan is somewhat broad compared to here. It has pretty good spectral diffusion. In this next one, actually each scan is very similar to what you find in natural diamond, but the spectral diffusion is significantly worse. However, we believe something like this, we can start to be able to control and have it lock to a single transition. So our next step is to integrate something with a thin dope layer into a cavity. Practically, we need to work with our growers to have higher densities of these NV centers at the surface. And then we'll integrate the cavity um, with the NV tuning. One thing that was particularly nice about this sample, and I don't have too much time to discuss it in detail, was once you start working with a growth collaborator, you, don't, you can actually specify more than just, I want NV centers close to the surface. You can say, for example, I want NV centers close to the surface, but I only want carbon-12 to be in my diamond. And so that's what we told our growth collaborators. They said, OK, yeah, we can grow carbon-12. So they grew this in a layer that was 99.99% carbon-12. Um, natural abundance diamond has about 1% carbon-13. The reason why we did this was because spins interact. And we don't want our electron spins interacting with the nuclei in our lattice. And this was a way that we could get very high spin coherence in a near surface sample. Um, I am going to skip that slide. So one way that we can measure the spin coherence, in addition to having we've already measured the optical properties, is to do something called optically detected magnetic resonance. What's important is that what we're doing is we are scanning a field over the different spin sublevels, and each spin sublevel actually has three possible nuclear sublevels. So here you see a triplet, and as we scan the RF field, we see a dip when we hit in the optical intensity as we hit a resonance. And what we're interested in is what the width of this dip is, because this width of this dip actually determines what our energy spread is 
of this transition in our coherence time. So we looked at the width of this dip for several of these NVs um, in this very surface doped layer. And here you actually can see the different line widths. And we also looked at how the line width varied as you got closer and closer to the surface. And here is the blue line is what you would see if, um, if we had worked with natural diamond. So we see that in the case where we have a very thin dope layer at the surface, not only do we have better spectral properties, we might be able to control them, but actually we can engineer our system to have significantly better spin properties as well, which is where we're storing the quantum information. Okay, and then this is just a spin echo on the sample to show that before when I said, oh, you can have one millisecond lifetime, that was in very pure diamond, far from the surface. In this sample, we have an NV sensor that's within 100 nanometers of the surface, and its spin lifetime in our measurement is also in the millisecond time scale. So in conclusion, um, I've shown you a lot of work that I've done at HP and continuing on here at University of Washington towards building this integrated quantum network. In particular, the components we need is to be able to tune the properties of NV centers, and we can do that using Stark tuning. We need to integrate them into photonic um, devices, and we've begun to do that by showing that we can integrate them into single cavities. And finally, we need to be working with NV centers that have good properties that are located very near to the sample surface to achieve our scalable quantum information network. So I want to give some acknowledgments. This was work that I did at HP Labs. Um, there's one um, staff scientist on the project, Charles Santori. The rest of us are postdocs. At any given time at HP, there's about two postdocs that are working on this type of project. We get our samples. Um, and it's a great place to go because, as you can see, uh, everyone goes on to get nice faculty positions. Paul's gone on to University of Calgary, and Andre is going on to Caltech. Um, at, uh, our, we got samples from our collaborators at Melbourne and at AST. And I do also want to note Toyo, who was a PhD student from Japan who helped with the spin measurements. He took an internship at HP Labs. And then life does go on after HP. Um, our lab is located in the physics building. Uh, we're studying spin properties of diamond for quantum information processing and also for magnetic sensing. And we're also looking at semiconductor holes for quantum information processing. Um, this is our group. We have uh, two postdocs, Todd and Nicole. Nicole's an EE student, or two graduate students, and our postdoc, Russell, and Nicole is the one who's continuing the gallium phosphide work. We found a gallium phosphide grower um, that we're collaborating with at Yale, and she's already shown tiny devices, gallium phosphide microdisks, that are still on the substrate that have quality factors that are three times better than the quality factors that we observed at HP Labs. Okay, thanks. And we have uh, maybe time for a few questions. So I can maybe lead off with a question, which is um, you, you talked about how narrow these lines are. Do you have some sense for the application, how, how much you have to control it? Is there, you know, where do you stand relative, you know, you talked about various line widths. What, what's, what do you think is necessary to make the quantum systems that you're, you're discussing here? Right. So you can. So you're never going to get two photons that are completely indistinguishable just from a solid state system. So we saw things where even when we put the feedback on, it, it's going in a straight line, but there is a little bit of drift. So one thing that you can do to mitigate this is actually, instead of exciting things resonantly, you excite things detuned, and you have a Raman transition, so you can mitigate this, but you lose an efficiency. So this is a technicality. So the question is, at what point can you detune enough to try to get things, your photon out, to be more coherent. And calculations show that if you're within 100 megahertz of diffusion, then you're OK. So for these centers, we should be OK. As long, but we have to add in another laser and do some, some special optics. Not? Yeah, gallium phosphide sample where you did the PL measurements of emission, I think, I believe, from the NV centers. 
So what is the lowest um, um, number of photons that can be detected by these particular systems? Um, um, it depends. You can get ones that have dark count rates in the tens if you want to pay the extra price. Um, standard ones have dark count rates in the, in the hundreds. So often you want to, I, I like detecting things in the 10,000 range just because it's, it's convenient for lab time scales, but obviously you can detect things in the 1,000 thousand count per second range as well. I think it's tough if you just try to do it yourself without ever being trained to, but if you... But, but do the experts in the field do that, like a single photon emission um, event in, in these systems? Because you know, you're perhaps looking at uh, um, you know, emission sometimes from a single qubit. And so no, it, it's tough to say, all right, I detected one click, but almost everyone in the field looks at single photon emission. I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty standard uh, technology that you can do. Like we can do it in our lab already here. It didn't take that long to build up. I, I had one other question, which was, uh, is it OK, you think, for the final system to have multiple NV centers within each of the, the devices coupled to each of the resonators, or does it have to be just one? So that's, that's an interesting question. Um, if you have multiples, if they're split and you can independently tune them in and out of the resonator, then that would be fine. If you, if you can't control them individually, so they're always both on resonance or both off on resonance, then there are certainly cute quantum toy games that you can play with those two in the resonator. But for scaling, um, that's going to probably be an unwanted feature. So you want device. at least only one that's contributing significantly. So if one was strongly coupled into the cavity and the others weren't. Yeah, and then you could tune that one off and tune another one on and use that same cavity as a resource to, mm -hmm. to shuttle ch chips. So you can use the other ones, but you just want to be able to individually control them. Okay. Well, no other questions? Uh, thank Kaime. Thank you. <laughs>